Welcome. Can you please stand and we'll begin in prayer. Blessed is our God at all times, both now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. And make us worthy, O Master, to dare with confidence and without condemnation to call thee Father, O God of heaven, and to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Someone's flashing me zero. I, I ran out of time for my introduction. <laughs> our, speaker, our speaker tonight, Christopher Check, is the Executive Vice President of the Rockford Institute in Rockford, Illinois. Chris holds a degree in English Literature from Rice University. His writings have appeared in many publications, including This Rock, The Wanderer, and The Chicago Tribune. He has addressed audiences at the University of London, the Pontifical Augustinian University in Nairobi, the Serbian Writers' Union in Belgrade, the National Press Club, Catholic Answers, the American Chesterton Society, La Goddess, Ave Maria University, and last but not least, the Institute of Catholic Culture. Please welcome back Mr. Christopher Check. Thank you, Sabatino. I love to be here. This is a lovely space, by the way, here at Thomas Beckett. Uh, I love to be here to lecture for the Institute, and I'm always grateful to be invited back. I hope that persists after tonight. <laughs> I was in Sicily in the early part of January for a program for the Rockford Institute on Sicily in the ancient world, and I changed planes in Rome. And at the gate in Rome, I ran into your bishop. And we had some conversation, and I said in the course, I took his hand with both hands, and I said, I want you to know you have a very fine young man operating within your diocese, Sabatino Carnazzo, running this magnificent institute of Catholic culture. And Bishop Laverde looked at me, and he said, I know, Sabatino, and I've been in Rome for my ad limina visit, and we included the Institute of Catholic Culture in our report to the Holy Father. Now, he didn't tell me what the Holy Father said. <laughs> but I have every good reason to believe that he was well pleased. So those of you who are supporting this organization, I want you to know that the good work that you are supporting has made its way all the way to the Holy See. All the way to the Holy See. And those of you who are not supporting, what more reason do you need to get your checkbook out tonight and write Sabatino a check before you leave? True story. Absolutely true story. That handout that I put together and that map that I drew with my own hand, that's not a true story. Uh, will help you to follow along with this talk, or as I like to say, it will give you hope that it's coming to an end. <laughs> Let's start with a little story. In the ancient city of Alexandria, a young boy and his friends are playing a game along the shore. Although he is somewhat shorter than his companions, the boy directs the game with authority and ease. His eyes sparkle and his smile flashes. Standing on a large rock, he makes a little oration, and his clear voice commands the attention and inspires the hearts of his comrades. The game captures the attention of the patriarch of the city, a man named Bishop Alexander. From the terrace of his palace overlooking the shore, he watches the boys at play and is soon alarmed to realize that their game is an imitation of the Christian rite of baptism. The boy in the center of things is acting as bishop, pouring water over the heads of his friends, the catechumens. The bishop dispatches a messenger to summon the boys, and when they arrive in his presence, he asks them what they were doing. The leader, whose name is Athanasius, 
declares with pride that they were having a game of baptism and that he was the bishop. (laughs) What words did you say while pretending at this rite? asks Bishop Alexander. And when Athanasius repeats word for word the formula for Christian baptism, the bishop asks him if he realizes that he has, in fact, baptized his friends. (laughs) Now the boy looks worried. (laughs) But I'm not a bishop, protests Athanasius. One need not even be a priest to baptize, the bishop answers. But far from going angry, he recognizes a quickness of mind and a brightness of soul in the boy. You have more to learn, the bishop tells him, and declares his intention to see directly to Athanasius' formation. Now this story, which comes from the pen of a 4th century Italian monk and church historian, Terinius Rufinus, may very well be something more than pious legend. After all, Rufinus was born when Athanasius was still alive. In any case, it does explain how the young Athanasius came to move into Bishop Alexander's house, receive his training in the faith, and in the year 318, at the age of 22 or thereabouts, was ordained a deacon and began service as Bishop Alexander's secretary. And it was in the same year that a priest of Libyan descent named Arius began to attract in ever greater numbers followers to the heresy that to this day bears his name and would threaten the existence of the Roman Catholic Church more fiercely than three centuries of Roman persecution. It is that heresy, the Arian heresy, and the courageous response of Athanasius and the persecution he heroically suffered for the rest of his life at the hands of the Arians and the ultimate triumph of the truth that we gather together this evening to discuss. Now, if you look up in the Catholic Encyclopedia, the entry on St. Athanasius, you will read that the life of Athanasius is a bewildering maze of events. This is true. In fact, to that, I would add, it is a bewildering maze of events, theological controversy, dates, places, persons, some of whom have the same name. There's four or five Eusebiuses in the story. In terms of geography, the scope of this story is huge with Rome in the southwest corner, Trier, Germany in the northwest corner, Asia Minor, Constantinople, Nicomedia, Nicaea, of course, in the northeast corner, and then down in the southeast corner, Alexandria and the deserts south of Alexandria. In terms of time, the story is vast. The ecclesiastical career of Athanasius spanned 55 years. He was a bishop for almost 45 years. He lived under five emperors, five popes, and he endured five exiles, totaling almost 20 years. So I see my first goal tonight is not to add more confusion to an already complex story. And so I think I'll stop right here and we'll go straight to questions and answers. (laughs) Would would that be okay? No? No. You've been warned. You've been warned. All right, well then, barring my first choice, we'll divide the story into four chunks. A little bit of background, chunk one, part one, a little bit of background on the world of the 4th century A.D., okay? The world of Athanasius, we'll call that. Part two, everyone should leave tonight with a basic understanding of the Arian heresy. Three, we will summarize the major events, works, trials in the life of St. Athanasius, and that's where it gets really thorny, so if you're going to take a nap in the middle of the talk, that's the time to doze off. But then you want to wake back up for the last part, part four, most important of all, 
What is Athanasius telling us today? What, is this, what are we going to get from this story today? What light can the story shed on our world today? What can we take from the example of St. Athanasius to inspire us? What can we take from the example of St. Athanasius to emulate? So four parts, by the end of which everyone in here will have what I like to call the cocktail party version of St. Athanasius. And by that I mean that the next time you're at a cocktail party and St. Athanasius comes up, (laughs) or the Arian heresy comes up, you are going to be able to sail through that conversation with authority and flair. Right? Don't, look, don't tell me the parties you're going to, you're not talking about the Arian heresy <laughs> or St. Athanasius. Right? Of course you are. Well, you're going to the wrong parties. No, really, you are talking about these things. You just may not realize it. Here, let me tell you, right now we have a man running for the President of the United States who is effectively an Arian. Right? Mitt Romney is a Mormon, and the Mormons are effectively Arians. Now, let's clarify here. When I say Arian in that sense, I'm not referring to uh, Nazi Germany in the 30s and the 40s, the, the master race. I'm talking about the heresy that denies the divinity of Jesus Christ. And this is, in fact, what Mormons do. They deny the divinity of Jesus Christ. So do Jehovah's Witnesses, for that matter. Uh, but Mitt Romney is... Now, if there were a Mormon here, he would explain why it's slightly more nuanced, but... They do deny the divinity of Jesus Christ. And so they are heirs of this Arian heresy. But if you're not talking about Mitt Romney at your cocktail parties, and that's perfectly fine with me, uh, closer to our hearts, closer to our hearts, we've just been given this magnificent new translation of the Novus Ordo of the Roman Rite. And in that new translation of the Novus Ordo of the Roman Rite, we have a much improved version of the creed, of the Nicene Creed that we say every Sunday at Mass, and contain therein, we no longer say now one in being with the Father, which is kind of an ambiguous, in English anyway, an ambiguous expression. Now we say consubstantial with the Father. Consubstantial with the Father. Consubstantial, this very phrase that rolls off our tongues every Sunday at Mass, we hardly think about it while we're saying it. And yet, This is at the center of the controversy of the Council of Nicaea in 325. And it subsequently tore the Catholic Church asunder. There were literally riots in the streets over this question. There were murders, exiles. At one point, most of the Catholic bishops did not subscribe to this basic tenet of the faith that Jesus Christ is consubstantial with the Father. Of the period St. Jerome wrote, the whole world groaned and was amazed to find itself Arian. But in the midst of this trial, the greatest the church had yet faced and the greatest it would face until the Protestant rebellion, more than a thousand years later, God raised up a single man to hold and keep the truth and defend it with humility and grace. Athanasius contra mundum. Athanasius against the world. All right, part one. The world of Athanasius. To better understand this era, we're going to have to let go of some of our paradigms. I hate that word. I just can't think of a different one. The (laughs) frames of reference. (laughs) Ways of thinking. The first one is, as children of the modern world, We labor under this illusion of the separation of church and state. We labor under this illusion. No one in the 4th century A.D. would have, if you had said separation of church and state to anyone in the 4th century A.D., he wouldn't even recognize that expression. He would not have understood what you were talking about. The way that we understand separation of church and state doesn't come even until after the medieval period, up into the beginning in the Renaissance, but really with the Enlightenment and then the Revolution in France. That is how new that expression is. But certainly, in the 4th century AD, if you'd said separation of church and state to somebody, what do you, you, I don't get it, I don't get it. And I bring this up because throughout the story we have emperors convening councils, right? We have emperors installing bishops, we have emperors deposing bishops, exiling them, all right? So there was an act, the, the sphere of the state and the sphere of the church were together. They cross, they cross. Now, 
we will find out in the course of this story where the state oversteps its authority. But what we ought to understand is when Constantine in 325 AD is calling, is convening a council, where is that coming from? Where is he getting that idea? Well, the reality is that the Roman emperor, of course, and Augustus, back at the beginning of the first century AD, it is Augustus who positions the emperor, he didn't call himself an emperor, but eventually they became to be called emperors, positions himself as the Pontifex Maximus. And in fact, we preserve that word, right, that expression right now, the Roman pontiff, derives from that very word. So the emperor as head of the state religion. Now we have three centuries of conflict between the church, but also convergence. I know I've talked about that when I've been here before, talking about the age of the martyrs, and I've got a, the CD of it over there to go into detail about it. But what we have is a period of tension between the young church and the empire, but we also have periods of convergence. And so what happens by the time Constantine has become emperor, because he's a central figure at the beginning of our story of Athanasius, he completely understands himself as the head of the state religion. And with the Edict of Milan, and then subsequent acts by Constantine, what becomes the state religion? Christianity becomes the religion of the Roman Empire, the official religion of the empire. And Constantine certainly saw himself as the head of that religion. Now you say, well, what about the Pope? It's an excellent question. The reality is, though, in terms of um, the organization of the church, the papacy is something that is developing over this time. But it really begins to take form later with Pope St. Gregory the Great, so almost 200 years later, where we see the kind of organization of the church that we understand and see today. In fact, there's almost nothing in the organization of the church today and in the liturgy of the church that does not bear the fingerprints of Pope St. Gregory the Great. But before him, we have this period where the Pope and the Emperor and the church and the empire are finding out how they relate to one another. I don't mean to belabor that point, but separation of church and state would not have made sense to these people. The second paradigm that we have to let go is one that afflicts many of the people in this room, myself included, not Sabatino, by the way, and that is that Latin Rite Catholics tend to think of the story of the church as a Western story, right? So we think of the martyrs in the Circus of Nero, the popes in Rome, the baptism of Clovis in France, Charlemagne in Germany. I mean, these are all good stories. These things happened. But the story of the church for the first three, four, even five centuries is an Eastern story. It is an Eastern story. And by that I mean it's a Greek story. Now, what's the reason for this? What are the reasons for this? Well, there are at least three. What's the most obvious one? Where does Christianity begin? In the East, right. Jesus Christ was born, he lived, taught, worked miracles, was crucified, rose from the dead, and ascended to heaven in the East. In the East. But 300 years before Jesus Christ, roughly, what great event in military history happens? Yeah, we talked about this. Alexander the Great, the conquest of Alexander the Great. You know, some see him sort of as the precursor of Christ. I think he's a little more complex character than that. But nonetheless, the effect of Alexander's conquest of the East was what? The spreading of that Hellenistic culture. In fact, the city where we began our story there, Alexandria, on the northern shore of Egypt, is named for Alexander the Great. And so he spread that Hellenistic culture, the Hellenistic language, the Hellenistic philosophy, the drama, the poetry, the literature, all this culture that, in fact, was the, the seed plot, if you will, to make possible the spread of the gospel. As I said, Alexandria was named for Alexander the Great. What's the famous landmark in Alexandria, one of the wonders of the world? The lighthouse, right? Alexandria is the center of commerce. But what else was in Alexandria? The library, right. Now, by the time of Athanasius, it's either partially or mostly destroyed. We're not exactly sure. That history is not altogether clear. But Alexandria was not only the center of commerce, it was the center of learning. And this is the world in which Athanasius grew up and was formed. 
He was formed deeply in that Greek culture, in that culture of Greek philosophy, of Greek thought, and that will come up in our story when we get to Nicaea. Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, even Homer. Athanasius quotes Homer in his works, and we'll see how the Greek philosophy comes to the fore when we get to Nicaea. Now, there's a third reason that this story is an Eastern story for the first few centuries, and it has to do with Roman political history. Who's the emperor right before Constantine? Diocletian. You've got a gold star. Diocletian gets a bad rap among Christians, I have to say, because he killed a lot of them. <laughs> but it's really unfair. Because, well, <laughs> Diocletian was, look, Diocletian, near the end of his reign, he says, I've had enough of this. I'm going to my farm to grow cabbages. Would that politicians did that today, <laughs> emulated Diocletian. Talk about things to emulate. But Diocletian didn't begin his career persecuting Christians. In fact, he had Christians in his household. His mother, I think his sister-in-law, or his wife. And he, he had close family relations were catechumens, and there were Christians advising him in his household. But he had a chap, his number two, named Galerius, who was like kind of a Karl Rove figure or if you don't like that, a sort of a Rahm Emanuel figure. And uh, and he said to Diocletian, these Christians are a mess. They are a threat to the empire. You've got to bring them down. And that, Galerius is really the author of those persecutions. But once they got going, they were, in fact, the worst and most severe of all of the persecutions. But nonetheless, Diocletian is responsible for one of the great strokes of genius in the history of political science. And it was called the... Tetrarchy. It's called the Tetrarchy. And it's uh, sort of a Greek word for rule of four. And he took this vast Roman Empire that was in chaos. I mean, I think the previous ten emperors before Diocletian, none of them reigned more than about two years. I'm generalizing, but I'm pretty close here. And about six or seven of them were murdered. Nobody wanted the job. The Roman Empire was in chaos up to this point. He invents the Tetrarchy. He divides the Roman Empire between East and West, and each side is ruled by its Augustus, the number one, and its Caesar, the number two. And he, Diocletian, realizes that he has got to be on the east of the empire, so he moves this capital city to Nico, well, not Constantinople, close, Constantinople doesn't exist yet, Nicomedia, Nicomedia. The political momentum, the center of political life of the Roman Empire has moved east. And then, of course, Constantine follows him, and what does he build? His great city, Constantinople, on the Bosporus. So these are the events that converge throughout history to make the east where things were going on at this time. When Constantine comes on the scene, this shift in the political center of the Roman Empire eastward is well underway, and he solidifies it, as I say, by building his city, Constantinople, on the Bosporus. All right, that's the background. What was this Arian heresy? In the year 318, as we said at the beginning of our story, at the age of 22 or thereabouts, Athanasius was ordained a deacon and began service as Bishop Alexander's personal secretary. And it was in that same year that a priest of Libyan descent named Arius began to attract in ever greater numbers followers to his heresy that to this day bears his name and would threaten the existence of the Roman church more fiercely than three centuries of Roman persecution. Who was Arius? Well, probably the best way to describe him is he was the first Christian rock star. He was wonderful at writing these little poems and songs and ditties with which he spread around his heresy. But it wasn't that he was a good songwriter. He was very, extremely popular. He was a celebrity. He was a sort of a celebrity figure. He wasn't even a particularly attractive fellow. He was very tall and thin. He had very long, stringy hair. And he worked very hard to cultivate the appearance of someone who led a life of austerity led an austere life. He had a habit of sort of writhing like a snake when he talked, according to the contemporary accounts. And sometimes in the middle of his preaching, he would explode into fits of frenzy. 
But his peculiar appearance and manner aside, he had a very captivating, engaging speaking style, and he was extremely popular with women. It's true. In the year 318, he was the pastor of a major parish in Alexandria, from the pulpit of which he proclaimed his heresy. Now, what was this Arian heresy? Well, let's go back some more. During the first three centuries of the church, most of the heresies focused on the nature of God and the mystery of the Trinity. So you had folks who would argue that there were not, in fact, three distinct persons in one God, but three manifestations of the same person, like three different faces, if you will, all right? And then you have the other extreme who would say that, in fact, there were three separate gods. There were three separate gods. Now, this, of course, is a, uh, a step backwards, but a whole slew of heresies that we put under the big tent today that we call Gnosticism came from this trend towards multiple gods, and this is horrible, horrible generalization, but for our purpose it'll serve. Most of the Gnostic heresies said something like this. There was a God who presided over the spiritual world and one who presided over the material world. And some took it further to say that the material world was evil. As a consequence, they ended up denying the incarnation. Why? Because in saying that the material world was evil... They concluded that Christ could not have actually physically entered the material world. Instead, they argued he only appeared to become a man. He only appeared to become a man. Well, as time went on, the fact of the Trinity did not go away. I mean, it's a mystery, but it's also a fact. And the faithful started to wrestle with the relationship of the three persons. Now, somebody who did this in the middle of the second century was a great man named Justin Martyr. And great saint that he was, he got it wrong. He said that the Son, the second personal blessed Trinity, did not exist from all time, but rather proceeded from the Father and was distinguished from the Father at the time of creation, and that he took on a human nature at the time of the incarnation. The problem with this interpretation of the Trinity, besides it's wrong, is what? It makes the Son somehow less than the Father. This heresy, the theologians call this subordinationism. The Son is subordinate to the Father. Now, before we get all upset about at Justin Martyr, we have to realize that we have the benefit of 2,000 years of the teaching church. The early fathers had to puzzle through these things with the guidance of the Holy Spirit, but they had to puzzle them through. And one of the difficulties is that they really lacked a vocabulary to accurately describe these relationships. Now, Justin Martyr didn't deny the divinity of Jesus Christ. That came later, and the biggest promoter of this heresy was Arius. It was Arius. Arius taught that there was a time when Christ did not exist and that he was created by God, the Father, that he was a creature, Now, the problem with this becomes very clear when we think about what that claim implies, right? What's something that all creatures have in common? They can change. In other words, if Christ could change, then he was capable of what? Sin. You see the problem. So in 321, Arius had been teaching this heresy for about three years, Bishop Alexander gathers his clergy, summons Arius, and in the presence of all the clergy of Alexandria, he says, let's hear it, Arius. Arius defends his teachings. It was decided that his teachings were unorthodox. He was called upon to abandon them, and he refused. So he was excommunicated. The author of the excommunication document was most likely our brilliant young deacon, Athanasius. Here's an excerpt. Now the apostates are these, Arius, Achilles, Antilles, Carpones, another Arius, and Sarmates, sometimes presbyters, Eusius, Lucius, Julius, Menes, Heladius, and Gaius, sometimes deacons, and with them Secundus and Theonus, sometimes called bishops. And the novelties 
they have invented and put forth contrary to the scriptures are these following. God was not always a father, but there was a time when God was not a father. The word of God was not always, but was made of things that were not. For God, that is, made him that was not of things that were not. Therefore, there was a time when he was not, for the son is a creature and a work. Neither is he like in substance to the Father, neither is he the true and natural word of the Father, neither is he his true wisdom, but he is one of the things made and created and is called the word and wisdom by an abuse of terms, since he himself was made the proper word of God and by the wisdom that is in God, by which God made not only all other things, but him also. Wherefore, he is by nature subject to change and variation as are all rational creatures. And the Father cannot be described by the Son, for the Word does not know the Father perfectly and accurately, neither can he see him perfectly. Accordingly, when someone asked them whether the Word of God can possibly change as the devil changed, they were not afraid to say that he can. For something made and created, his nature is subject to change. Now, when the Arians made these assertions and shamelessly avowed them, we being assembled with the bishops of Egypt and Libya, nearly a hundred in number, anathematized both them and their followers. Well, you would think that would have been the end of it. But it was not. Arius ran off first to his friend Eusebius of Caesarea, who we know as the father of church history, but alas, is someone who fell into this Arian heresy. And then from there, he ran off to his friend Eusebius of Nicomedia. There's two of these men, Eusebius of Nicomedia and Arius, had gone to school together at the school at Antioch. In fact, this whole story of the Arian heresy can be viewed as a quarrel between the Antioch and the Alexandrian school. Now, the thing about this guy, Eusebius of Nicomedia, was that he was very close to whom? To the emperor, Constantine. And he was particularly close to Constantine because of his association with Constantine's sister, a woman named Constantia. And so by way of Constantine's sister, he gets Constantine's ear. And he says, look, these people in Alexandria don't know the truth of the story. They do not know the truth of the story. You need to solve the problem. And now we get back to the point that I tried to make to you at the beginning. Constantine realizes, as the head of the state religion, he has to resolve this problem. And so what does Constantine do? He convenes the Council of Nicaea in 325. Now, some folks explain this as saying that Constantine simply thought that arguments inside the empire were bad for peace. Well, he certainly did think that, but he believed himself to be more invested than that. The emperor was the head of the state religion, the state religion was Christianity, and Constantine's duty was to settle the matter. In fact, if Constantine had not called the Council of Nicaea, people would have said to him, you're not doing your job. Now, the Council of Nicaea was a great event, and we'll have to whirl through it very quickly, but it was a gathering of all of the heroes of the final persecution. So you had men who had survived that final persecution. St. Nicholas was there, of course. What does St. Nicholas do on the floor of the council? Yeah, He gives, he gives, I, some people say slaps, but I think he gave a closed fist to the jaw of Arius. This nice guy that brings Christmas presents, right? <laughs> yes, true story, true story. But you had all these heroes who had endured persecution, they were missing tongues, they were missing eyes, they bore the scars of being beaten. All the heroes who had survived the final persecution were gathered there. It would be great to be there. Can you imagine being in that room? Were gathered there at the Council of Nicaea. Constantine footed the bill. He paid for it. You could, if, you, if you were a bishop and you couldn't afford to come, he paid your way, he bought your ticket, he paid for your coach, he put you up, he paid for everything. The Pope Pope Sylvester sent two legates, right? Demonstrating, of course, that his word was central to the question. He sent two legates. One was named Vincent, and the other was named Vito. So the, so the, so the tradition of Italians sending a guy named Vito to a meeting <laughs> to exercise his will 
goes, in fact, all the way back to the Council of Nicaea. And, of course, our hero Athanasius was there, right by his bishop, advising him. And what did they do? They came up with this creed that we say every Sunday, right? The Nicene Creed. And central to this creed, we've translated into the Latin consubstantial, but they used a Greek word, homoousion, homoousion, consubstantial, all right, to describe the relationship between the Father and the Son, homoousion. Now, this is an extremely important moment in the development of theology. Why? Because it is the first time officially the church is using what? A non-scriptural word. A non-scriptural word. And this is why I went through all that boring stuff at the beginning about the spread of Hellenistic culture. Because it is, in fact, that Greek philosophy that is informing and now being transformed in Christ at the moment of the Council of Nicaea. So they use a non-scriptural word, homoousion, for the first time to describe this relationship. And at the end, at the end of the Nicene Creed, they append an anathema. And for those who say, There was a time when he, the son, did not exist, or he was begotten. He did not exist. He was made from nothing or from another substance or essence. The son of God is a created being, changeable, capable of alteration. To such as these, the Catholic Church says, anathema. Anathema. Only two bishops refused to sign the anathema. They were banished along with Arius, whose books were burned, and a great banquet followed. Constantine presided. He made a great speech at the banquet. It would have been great to be there. A couple other things real quick about the Council of Nicaea, a couple other things that were brought up. One, priestly celibacy was reaffirmed as having pride of place among the clergy, and also the date of setting the date of Easter was resolved at the Council of Nicaea. That should have ended the problem, right? But instead... Athanasius spent the rest of his life fighting the Arian heresy. Now, after Nicaea, is everybody still with me? We're still doing, we're still awake? (laughs) Now it's for the authority. One year after Nicaea, Athanasius is appointed bishop of Alexandria, right? He tries to avoid the job, good sign. Somebody wants to be a bishop, bad sign, right? But he's appointed, elected bishop of Alexandria, okay? Eusebius realizes that he can't assault the Nicene Creed. Eusebius of Nicomedia realizes he can't assault the Nicene Creed directly. Why? I mean, everybody's just signed this document, and the emperor's given his approval to it. So he goes to Constantine, and he says, look, um, this division in the empire with Arius over here banished, that's bad. That's bad blood. We don't want that. Let's all, can't we all get along? Right? He starts talking that way. And then he realizes that if he can't attack the Nicene Creed, what does he do? What do we do when we can't attack someone's argument? We start attacking the person, right? So he starts attacking the chief defender of the Nicene Creed. He starts attacking Athanasius. And he gets Constantine to... Constantine's an interesting figure in history. Many great things about him, many not so great things about him. But one thing is he's a pretty suggestible fellow. He's mercurial. He's changing his mind. But Eusebius gets Constantine to send a letter to Athanasius telling him that he has to accept Arius into his diocese. On being informed of my pleasure, give free admission to all who are desirous of entering to communion with the church. For if I learn of your standing in the way of any who were seeking it or interdicting them, I will send at once those who shall depose you instead by my authority and banish you from your sea. So under threat of banishment, we have Athanasius now having to respond. Well, what does he do? What does Eusebius of Nicomedia do? He starts to drum up all of these charges against Athanasius. And they play like, you know, a modern TV drama. The first thing they say is that he is guilty of cutting the hand off of a bishop and using the hand in some black magic rites. And then they accuse him of harassing a pious priest named Iscarus. And then they accuse him of violating a consecrated virgin. So he goes to Tyre, and he answers all of these charges. And it's a great assembly, and the Arians produce, you know, this kind of black, withered, severed hand. And said, this is the hand of Bishop Arsenius. 
And Athanasius says, oh, really? Well, and then he has Bishop Arsenius with him as part of his entourage. And he takes the hood off of his coat and he says, oh, well, this is Bishop. Oh, let's see. And then he takes out one hand. Oh, no, it's still here. And then he takes out the other one. And, oh, oh, no. Oh, well, has anyone given him three hands? Bishop Arsenius, did you get three hands? So he does that number. And then he immediately dismisses the charge of Iscaris. It turns out this man was never a priest to begin with. And then the charge of the consecrated virgin who was violated. They bring the girl out. And she starts, oh, yes, and he did this to me in great detail, and he did this to me, and this to me, and this to me. So one of Athanasius' entourage goes up to the young lady. His name is Timothy. And he says, and did I take you into my home? Yes, and I can find you there. And she said, yes, you did. You did all those things. You did all those things. She's not even realized. Of course, she's not even talking to Athanasius. Well, as soon as they realize, she flees the room. She says, no, bring her back. I want to know who put her up to this. So finally, they accuse him of withholding grain from the grain dole that was supposed to go up to Constantinople. Constantine calls him up to Constantinople to answer the charges, and Constantine believes this last charge, and he banishes Athanasius. And this is his first exile. It lasts for two years in Trier, where in Germany, where he is the guest of Constantine's son, Constantine II. While in Trier, something important happens. While Athanasius is there, Arius dies. And he comes to a very unpleasant death. Constantine orders the bishop of Constantinople to accept Arius back into his diocese. The man's name also is Bishop Alexander. Bishop Alexander does not wish to do this. So he spends the night praying before the Blessed Sacrament, saying, Lord, please do not let this indignity fall upon your church. The next morning... Arius comes walking down the center boulevard of Constantinople where he thinks he's going to be receiving the communion of the church. And just as he approaches the church, he's afflicted with a great pain in his bowels. And now it gets a little indelicate. He asks his friends where the public loo is. And he runs off there, and then he begins to expel the contents of his bowels, and then his bowels themselves begin to be expelled from out of Arius. And according to one of the contemporary accounts, he stands up and he slips on his intestines and smashes his head and dies. And this was a sure sign to the Catholics that God had settled this question. (laughs) That God had settled this question. (laughs) Athanasius' first exile ends when Constantine dies. Constantine II, his son, says, you can go back to your sea, but... The empire is divided in half between Constantine II, who is a Catholic, and Constantius, who is not. He is an Arian. And he says, not so fast, brother. And he tells Athanasius, no, you cannot come back to your sea. And this is Athanasius' second exile. During this period, an intruder named Gregory of Cappadocia is put on the throne in Alexandria. He is an Arian. During this time, Athanasius goes to Rome to plead his case before Pope Julius. The important thing to remember about this particular part of the story is that he brings the Eastern Egyptian tradition of monasticism to the West. So, of course, we say Benedict is the father of Western monasticism, but it really is Athanasius who brings this tradition of monasticism to the West. He is eventually restored. Constantius finally agrees to uh, popular pressure. He restores him after a period of years to his diocese, and then there's a decade of peace. Meanwhile, while he comes back and he's governing his diocese, and the Arians are holding one false council after another, trying to come up with one formula after another that would undermine the Nicene Creed, and Constans, Constantine II's brother, is murdered, And now Constantius has rule of the whole of the Roman Empire, and he exiles Athanasius third time. And it is during this exile that Constantius holds the Council of Milan. St. Athanasius describes the scene. Arian bishops dragged the pen from the hand of the Bishop of Milan as he prepared to sign the Creed of Nicaea as an indication of his orthodoxy. The council became a riot, the mob invaded the church to defend its bishop, and the council's next meeting took place in the palace in this more favorable locale. The imperial will had its way more easily. The emperor 
having summoned the bishops, ordered them to sign the condemnation of Athanasius and to receive the heretics into communion. They protested against this innovation in church discipline, crying out that such is not the ecclesiastical rule, whereupon the emperor broke in, my will is canon law. Bishops in Syria make no such objections when I address them, obey me or exile. Obey me or exile. Athanasius is restored to his diocese after the death of Constantius because a man comes on the throne who is not a Christian, in fact, Julian the Apostate. And Julian the Apostate has, at least at first, a kind of a sense of religious tolerance, but he eventually grows weary of Athanasius because Athanasius is converting the pagans in Alexandria. Remember, Julian the Apostate is the one who tries to bring pagan practices back to the Roman Empire, and he ends up exiling Athanasius again. But before that, it was in this third exile that Athanasius spends his time in the desert. And it is during that time when he spends a great deal of time with St. Anthony of the desert and begins to work on his biography of St. Anthony of the desert. And you'll hear about that more, but I'll tell you three things now. It is the earliest extensive biography of a saint It emphasizes the need for prayer and mortification if we are properly to understand the scriptures, and it describes how the devil seduces through pride the souls even to the rejection of God. During this time, Athanasius has an intruder put on his diocese, a man named George of Cappadocia, who uses the position really to make money. He takes control of the salt monopoly, and also he builds a coffin factory. And he says, if anyone wants Christian burial, he has to purchase one of my coffins. The people of Alexandria respond by killing him. So (laughs) Athanasius faces two more short exiles at the end of his life, really based on the whims of the emperor that comes in. Jovian comes in, he restores him. Then Valens comes in, he exiles him. Finally, he's brought back under popular pressure and he lives his final 10 years or so there in peace. All right. I went through that part quickly because it can get bogged down, and I want to spend a little bit of time now on part four. That is, what is Athanasius telling us today? What is there in the life of Athanasius from which we can draw inspiration? Well, first about our world today. One, the church in disobedience. Disobedience isn't new, all right? It goes all the way back to this story even before. So Charlie Curran up here at Catholic University in the 60s, Nancy Pelosi, right, Secretary Sibelius, right, all these things have been going on for a very long time. There's a silver lining, by the way, to this business with health and human services, and that is now the question of contraception is being brought to the fore, and the Catholics who were ignoring this question are now saying, oh, the church teaches this? Why does the church teach this? So this is actually something good that's coming from this. But disobedience isn't new. It's not going away. It will be with us until the end of time. But the church is a patient mother. And yes, she condemns the heretic, of course, but she welcomes back the repentant. Two, well-educated does not necessarily mean faithful or even good. History is full of very intelligent, even brilliant people whose pride gets the better of them. Arius was a well, extremely well-educated man. And Eusebius of Nicomedia, these were well-educated people. They'd studied the scriptures, they'd studied the Greek philosophers. These were as educated as you could get. Martin Luther was a well-educated man. Three, the church is methodical and patient in evaluating heresy and error. She takes her time, but she will always root out the truth. The church will always root out the truth. If it is true, it belongs to the church. The church is the guardian of all truth. So she takes her time, but eventually she lays hold of all that is true. Four, in the Arius story, you see something that we still see to this day, and that is dissenter as victim, right? Arius was always trying to cast himself to the emperor as, look, you know, this guy Athanasius is a jerk. He can't get along with anybody. I'm the victim here. I'm the victim. And you see this all the time with Father Flager in Chicago, those of you who know that story, all the people who want to, you know, practice contraception. Oh, I, the, you know, I have the right to do this. It's my body. I have the right to kill my baby, all these things. It is always dissenter as victim, right? That is something that's been going on since the beginning of dissent. 
casting yourself as the victim. Five, the freedom of the church is always going to be threatened by the state. It went on in the age of the martyrs. It went on in Athanasius's age. It went on in the Protestant rebellion in England under Henry VIII. It went on in the revolution in France. It went on in the Cristero War in Mexico, the Spanish Civil War, and it's going on right now in the United States today. Athanasius was a champion of the independence of the church from the state. Cardinal George said recently that he expected to die in his bed. He expects his successor to die in jail, and he expects that man's successor to die before a firing squad. May well be. All right, now the personal example that Athanasius gives us. Well, first of all, it's an obvious case of perseverance, even when it's unpopular. Those who defend the truth against the prevailing consensus must often face the prospect of appearing stubborn, proud, intransigent, even ignorant. Or they'll be accused of not being a team player, right? Like to Thomas More, come along for fellowship. Or to the patron of this church, Thomas Beckett, exact same story. A man who's willing to act alone, John Fisher, Pope Benedict. When's the church going to get with the times, Pope Benedict? These people are asking him. The final message from Athanasius himself is that to have the necessary clarity of intellect, to be able to interpret the scriptures in the mysteries of our faith, it is necessary to have a pure heart. This is what he writes in his book, The Incarnation of the Word. But for the searching and right understanding of the scriptures, there is need of a good life and a pure soul, and for Christian virtue to guide the mind to grasp so far as human nature can, the truth concerning God the Word. One cannot possibly understand the teachings of the saints unless one has a pure mind and is trying to imitate their life. Anyone who wants to look at sunlight naturally wipes his eye clear first in order to make, at any rate, some approximation to the purity of that on which he looks. And a person wishing to see a city or country goes to the place in order to do so. Similarly, anyone who wishes to understand the mind of the sacred writers must first cleanse his own life and approach the saints by copying their deeds. Thus united to them in the fellowship of life, he will both understand the things revealed to them by God and thenceforth, escaping the peril that threatens sinners in the judgment, will receive that which is laid up for the saints in the kingdom of heaven. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris, for a wonderful presentation. We're going to take a short break and come back together for Q&A. Is uh, Athanasia the author of the Athanasian Creed? No. The question was, is Athanasius the author of the Athanasian Creed? Uh, and the Athanasian Creed, I don't have committed to memory, but it's the one where it says, and such and such and just anathema sit. And it says, by the way, if, if you were a Catholic priest and you had a dog, you should, you could name your dog anathema. <laughs> anathema sit. <laughs> so, um, the Athanasian Creed, to which are appended all these, uh, anathemas, was written maybe a century or more later. Does anybody, Sabatino, do you have the exact time on that? Or, but it, it's called that because it has the character of, of Athanasius with his anathemas. So, good question. Good question. And I will tell you, don't record this, I did not know that until I began to prepare for this talk. So. Actually, I'm wondering, especially considering how popular the Arian heresy was for so long, how obvious was it that it was a heresy and not actually an orthodox doctrine? Yeah, this is an excellent question, and it wasn't obvious. It, well, it wasn't obvious at first, but once the Council of Nicaea had made it clear that it was a heresy, it was obvious to the faithful. And I raced through a lot of this, but Athanasius is restored to his see a couple of times simply because it is, in fact, the people of Alexandria who insist that he be brought back. So in very much in this sense, the faithful are the ones who are preserving the true teaching of the church, and the episcopacy are the ones who have gone off the rails. Up to the point in Nicaea, 
we can give Arius the benefit of the doubt. I think actually there are reasons not to, but we can. But after Nicaea, there's no reason to. And now it's simply men, bishops, seeking power and manipulating the emperor and seeking to destroy a man who is, in fact, holding the, the truth. So, I had heard that Liberius, at one point, the pope, had signed some sort of quasi-Arian document under duress. And I just wondered how um, St. Athanasius responded to that practically speaking. Well, he writes about it in his account of this. Uh, all this can be read in, in Athanasius' works. If you want the really scholarly analysis of this, it's Cardinal Newman's book called The Arians of the Fourth Century. And Cardinal Newman can be a little tough to wade through sometimes, but it's well worth it if you want to get deep into this tale. There are historians who precede Cardinal Newman, who try to cut Liberius a little bit of slack. Cardinal Newman does not. And Liberius did certainly sign a semi-Arian formula, homo e, usion, just the I inserted there between the O's, uh, of like substance, would be how we would translate that, not of the same substance, of, but of like substance, and that's called the semi-Arian. He definitely signed that, and he probably signed a straight-out Arian formula, too, from one of these, one of these sort of pseudo-synods of the Arian bishops. Now, Liberius, was dragged into exile over this point. And he was in exile for two years before his fall. And under that duress, the Arian bishops, or Eusebian bishops as they were also called, said to him, look, your job, you're the Pope in Rome. You should be back in Rome. You need to be restored to your see. So come on, go along. Let's get this taken care of. And in fact, finally, he does capitulate and sign and I left some of this out because Sabatino was flashing markers at me in the back of the room. There. And it was after, it was after that that now the emperor went around forcing a lot of bishops to sign this formula. And many of them did. Three or four went into exile, but many of them did. This is a story, the fall of Pope Liberius, that's popular among Protestants as a charge that the doctrine of papal infallibility is not, in fact, a real doctrine. But the reality is he signed it under duress. And it was not an ex-cathedra teaching. So it's, I mean, that's kind of the short version. If you go to Cardinal Newman, you can get a more detailed analysis of it. But it almost certainly did happen. And it, it was not a violation of papal infallibility. It was the moral failing of an individual man, and regrettable. Excellent question. We have a question coming in from Martin in North Carolina. You may want to push this off to the talk on St. Anthony. I'll leave that up to you. If you could comment on the time uh, in which St. Anthony of the Desert came out of the desert to assist St. Athanasius uh, defending orthodoxy. Yeah, I will, I will pass that on. Okay. Yeah, so Martin, come up from, from North, North Carolina. Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> now, what is also true is that, is that Athanasius, while he was in exile, he did go around ordaining priests and possibly even some bishops... That's less clear in other dioceses, in other sees that were not his. So when he was exiled from his see, he did go and ordain legitimate priests in various dioceses so that the true faith could continue to be preserved. So, I have a question. I hope you don't think it's too far afield. Please just tell me. The, um, I mean, it's too far about, afield. Talk, <laughs> talk about the, the, the creed and, and the careful words consubstantial used to clarify the nature of Christ and this divinity. And yet the same creed years later, with the, uh, the, the additional words added, created a great schism, the, uh, uh, that the nature of the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. I don't have the theological background to know the one iota of difference there. But w what would St. Athanasius have weighed in on that speculatively? Yeah, okay, so the question refers to the conflict surrounding what we call the filioque, and uh, whether or not the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. I don't have a theological background either. I would feel certain that if Athanasius were confronted with this question, he would certainly take the uh, orthodox, that is small o, orthodox position. But Sabatino, who is much more familiar with the East and with the theology of the East, is better equipped to answer that question. Well, I would just say that the Council of Nicaea did say that you couldn't add anything to the creed, and it was later added on. It was also condemned by Rome. It was an addition that took place in Spain when they were combating a form of the Arian heresy in the 7th century. And just regarding the uh, the East or the Orthodox, 
the original issue was not a theological issue. It was an authority issue of whether you could add to something an ecumenical council had said without an ecumenical council. That was the problem they had initially. And later on, different theologians then took arms at the issue itself, at the phrasing itself. So Charlemagne we'll is involved also in that, in, in inserting Absolutely. that. And, yeah, yeah it, the use of the filioque spread throughout the West through Charlemagne's court, yeah, yeah. but initially condemned by Rome, I, I saying CD, you can't so. just add something to the creed. Because otherwise, there's, you could add a, a multitude of doctrines. Obviously, the creed is not exhaustive. And so that was the original issue regarding authority. Yeah, but. Well said. It's great speaking here because if you don't know the answer to the question, Sabatino does. <laughs> Did the uh, members of the Council of Nicaea base their findings and the creed on Scripture? Uh, yes, they did. And um, chiefly the prelude of John's Gospel uh, and the Father and I are one. The other references Christ makes to the Trinity. I mean, the word Trinity isn't named in the Gospel, of course. But what is... I don't want to say novel, but what is new at the council is the use of a non-scriptural word, homoousian, to describe this theological relationship. I make this point because sometimes evangelicals, for example, why do we read all these pagan myths? Why are we interested in these pagan philosophers? These people were essential. Their work was essential to laying the way of thinking, the vocabulary and the way of thinking in order to give expression to complex theological mysteries. And, of course, the most obvious example of this is when Thomas Aquinas goes down to set down the methods of Christian theology, who does he, he doesn't go to Moses, right? He goes to Aristotle. He goes to Aristotle. You say that uh, the essence of what St. Athanasius defended at the Council of Nicaea, in other words, the points that he was making as far as a theological, was that in Scripture... Christ had asserted that he and the Father are one, similar type statements within the Gospel. Is that right? Yes. That was the essence of his uh, defense of orthodoxy as we know it today. Okay. But as was pointed out in a previous question here, Arius was, had quite a following which went on for quite a while. What was the point that these particular theologians with Arius felt made them continue with this heresy for a while? In other words, was it something like it's difficult to see two persons in one, you know, kind of a mathematical contradiction, whereas we would think that God is one and that there wouldn't be two persons in one God. Something like that. Was that what the point was they were making? Obviously, a lot of followers to Arius at the time. Yes. I mean, we talked about Justin Martyr trying to organize in his imagination and his understanding the relationship between the Father and the Son. And how can something be begotten but not created? When we use these words, we presume that we have an understanding of them, but uh, let's just see in the room here who could, let's get a, a difference between begotten and created, because these things sort of tend to overlap. That's why I, I made the point that we have to sort of give a little bit of benefit of the doubt to the early fathers, and Arius not among them, but even Arius, as he's trying to sort this problem out, the difficulty with him so far as my story is concerned, I'm not a theologian, is that once an ecumenical council is declared, then obedience to the mystery is what is required. But Arianism doesn't go away. Athanasius dies, and then in most of the church it goes away. But where does it persist? All of the uh, savages north of the Alps, which includes a lot of the people in this room, myself included, yeah, um, Gauls, the Goths especially. A lot of these people were evangelized by Arian priests and Arian bishops. When the Goths come into Italy, if you go to Ravenna, just south of Venice today, you see Arian churches with beautiful mosaics in there, but it's, they're still sort of creepy when you go in because you know, okay, well, here's where this heresy. The heresy lasts for a time, and I, and I think I'm sympathetic to your question insofar as I think I understand it. It's confusing. Well, the Trinity is mysterious. It's hard to get your imagination around. Thank you very much, Chris. Sure.